All right. Well, uh, welcome to um, this version of our University of Minnesota Certificate of Elections Administration program webinars. Um, today, we're doing a webinar on voting in jail, uh, developing a program to help eligible incarcerated Americans. Um, really happy to have you here today. A really exciting program, something that I take uh, very seriously and um, I hope that you'll enjoy the program. Um, just a reminder that you can get a live transcript so that you can um, kind of uh, join along uh, if you're hearing impaired or if you uh, want to follow along uh, reading the transcript. You can also ask questions at the QA on the page. So um, please do send us some questions. We uh, curate those and I try to ask as many of those as I can. Um, and you can send them uh, throughout the program. We sort of collect them and uh, ask later once we have some time. The, um, uh, it is good to get those questions in early because it gives me a chance to sort of figure out what where the sort of topic areas are, uh, but you can ask them throughout. Uh, a reminder about our Certificate of Elections Administration program at the University of Minnesota. Uh, this is a 12 hour or 12 credit program uh, where you can become certified as an elections administrator by taking classes through the University of Minnesota. It's for uh, graduate students, undergraduates. It's uh, a, a program that uh, you can take if you've never taken a college course. Uh, it's uh, online, uh, accessible anywhere in the country, anywhere in the world. And it's taught by pretty amazing instructors from around elections administration uh, in, in the US and US elections. Uh, so um, really encourage you to learn more about it. Uh, there are two ways that you can participate, either through signing up uh, for the certificate and taking the 12 credits that I mentioned, but you can also just try out a class. You can um, decide uh, to join the certificate program later after you've taken a class and uh, enjoyed it. Um, so uh, feel free to sort of look into that and learn more. Uh, there is an admissions process. Uh, the best, there's a couple of links there, but the, what I always tell everybody is it's at the Hubert H. Humphrey School at the University of Minnesota. So what you do is you go to Google and you put in HHHCEA and it'll, it's the first thing that comes up in your search. So it's a great, great way to find it quickly. Uh, this uh, spring, we've got a course from Maurice Turner, who's teaching a class on election security. And then this summer, we've got uh, the world famous Jennifer Morell, who's teaching an intro to election security class. And then um, Catherine uh, Pearson, who's teaching the strategic management and elections administration class. Those are both offered this summer. So if you uh, had some time this summer to take a class, those are both available. And then Maurice's class is in March. So it's only in a couple of weeks you could sign up for that election security class then. Uh, and we also offer an opportunity for you to learn more about the CEA program. Uh, we have monthly CEA info sessions. It just so happens that the next session is tomorrow at noon central time. So if you wanna learn more about the program, ask some questions, how much does it cost? How much the t is the time? Is it really worth it? You know, what kind of, uh, what, what do I get out of this program? Um, all of those kinds of questions can uh, be answered at one of these info sessions. The next one is tomorrow at noon central time, you know, on March 18th, and then on April 17th. Okay, so let's learn about uh, voting in jail, developing a program to help eligible incarcerated Americans. Um, before we get started, I wanted to alert you to the fact that we have two new reports that are out, both from Harvard, from the Ash Center. Uh, the first by Tova Wang, who's uh, joined us today. Thank you, Tova. And she uh, has this uh, very detailed report about the um, jail-based voting in the District of Columbia, uh, which uh, dovetails perfectly on the fact that Scott Sussman, who leads that program, is going to talk to us here in just a moment. And then we also have a recommendation for implementing jail voting by Christine Trang, who is... Um, uh, also at the Ash Center. And the great thing about that, I was uh, leafing through it this morning. It's an amazing resource on pretty much any question you might have about jail voting. So um, any topic you have, there's a list of resources under that topic. So really encourage you to look at those. 
Uh, Cody from uh, the uh, CEA team is putting that in the chat, so you should be able to access it. And we'll put it in again later in the program. So uh, for those uh, that are joining a little later. All right, so uh, that brings us to today's program. And uh, we are uh, very lucky to have Scott Sussman, who's the program manager uh, for Restore the Vote program at uh, uh, the District of Columbia Board of Elections, and Mesa Sitar, who is uh, the Voter Accessibility Administrator at uh, the Denver Elections Division. Um, I'm going to hand it off to Scott. And Scott, can you do a little bit of an introduction about yourself and then uh, kick it off? Um, yes, uh, thanks, Judge. Thanks, Judge. Very screen now. Oh, okay. Thanks, Judd. Um, so as Judd said, my name is Scott Sussman. I'm the program manager at the District of Columbia um, Board of Elections. In a former life, I spent 26 years working for the Federal Bureau of Prisons, the last uh, 10 of which was in the reentry space doing an awful lot of liaison work. And because of that work, while I was there, the DC Board of Elections reached into me to try to get their program off the ground where they could uh, do some outreach into the uh, Federal Bureau of Prisons and get folks to register and vote. And I was the lucky guy that answered the phone. Now, originally I didn't think that um, it was really a reentry issue. However, as the program got off the ground, I realized uh, quite frankly that it was, and the topic excited me. So we jumped in with, uh, with both feet. So, um, no. There we go. That's painfully slow. So the real reason I'm here, the Restore the Vote Amendment Act was a legislative vehicle used to restore voting rights to those with felony convictions. And that included those who are currently incarcerated. Uh, it also um, codified the fact that I needed to work with the DC Department of Corrections, the Federal Bureau of Prisons, and the DC Department of Youth and Real Rehabilitative Services. I won't talk about that last one, but I will talk about the, the DOC and the Federal Bureau of Prisons. Another legislation that we used to modify the shortcomings of the Restore the Vote Amendment Act was the Election Modernization Act, and I will touch on that in just a, a, a little bit as the topic comes up. Something that wasn't legislated is we actually have five different other partnerships. We work with our county departments of corrections. So for those that do not benefit from actually having a law that compels your local jail to help you, um, we have experience in working with those that are also not compelled and hopefully sharing our story will help. Uh, so our first partnership, so talk about the DC Department of Corrections. The RTV, the Restore the Vote uh, Act, um, has the DOC as a automatic voter registration site. Now that's an awfully heavy lift for a Department of Corrections to be able to do. So they're working on that and they're not quite there yet. Automatic being that someone, everyone that comes through their door is registered to vote unless they actively opt out. So that's not quite the case yet. The reality is when people come in, they ask them if they'd like to register. If they say yes, they get a form and they can mail it in. There's also some other touch points when they meet with case managers and counselors that will ask them if they'd like to register. So the reality, and the reality is that's much more effective because when you walk in the door or are brought through the door, I should say, um, your first day in jail is probably not the time where you're thinking of uh, registering to vote. So those other touch points are important. The DC Department of Corrections was also uh, they were also, they also assigned, I'm sorry, a staff liaison. So it's very nice to have one point of contact. And the DOC also works closely with community partners. Now I work with those same community partners, but the DOC does some of their own work uh, independently of us, which helps out greatly. One of the Restore the Vote uh, Act charges is that we also provide education. And the DOC has to provide that education as well but we provide those materials to the DOC in the form of uh, mailings, in-person education um, drives, voter registration drives, uh, as well as in-person voting. 
Um, but we write those materials so that the DOC doesn't have to. Uh, we're also, um, the, excuse me, the majority of, of voting that we receive, ballots that we receive from the DOC come by way of mail ballots. In DC, we have 100% of our folks who are registered receive a mail ballot. And that includes those that are in the jail. But we also decided in the 2022 primary that we would provide a in-person vote center. And we staffed that vote center with uh, our own staff. Uh, and it was quite great. I've got some statistics later on that, that shows that it was a success. Um, but we took it to the next level in the 2022 general election and decided to um, staff the vote center with the actual inmate population. And that turned out to be a rousing success. The votes didn't increase that much, but the as, as you'll see with stats, um, but in DC, the primary primary um, elections, quite frankly, often are the more the most important election. Um, but what the what having the inmate population run the vote center did was created buzz around the election itself. Because in order to be trained as an election worker, you needed to be registered. Uh, and quite frankly, in order to run in an election, you needed to be registered as well, which brings me to my next bullet here, which is an advisory neighborhood commission. For those that don't know, DC is, is divided up into neighborhoods of around 2000 residents. And the jail itself is within one of those neighborhoods. And as an inmate in that facility, you can run as a commissioner. And in the last election, we do have an ANC commissioner who is uh, who is incarcerated there. So quite exciting. The next partnership I'd like to talk about is the Federal Bureau of Prisons. That is a uh, very important but quite complicated relationship that we have with the with the Bureau of Prisons. The Restore the Vote Act is a DC law. It is not a federal law. The Bureau of Prisons does not have to abide by DC law. It only has to abide by the federal laws. Therefore, it's, it, it took a presidential executive order to help compel the Bureau of Prisons to um, at least provide its residents, uh, its inmate population, um, education on voting rights. Well, it happens to be that, you know, we're one of four jurisdictions that allow their inmate populations to vote, if you include Puerto Rico. And um, that, <clears throat> excuse me. That executive order helped greatly in that it assigned a liaison. It, it, it compelled the Bureau of Prisons to assign a liaison to work uh, with outside departments of, of, of um, excuse me, I keep wanting to say Department of Correction, Departments of Election. So they help out with registering and they also help out with, with, with voting, but voting must be done by mail ballots only, um, as you can probably tell, because the, we don't have local Federal Bureau of Prisons. DC jail does not, I'm sorry, the city of DC does not have its own prison system. It does have a jail, but if you're going to do more than a year or so in, in, in prison, you're going to be shipped off to another state. So therefore, all of our ballots have to be done through mail. And we have at least one inmate in 81 of 122 federal institutions. Button doesn't want to work. There we go. So uh, some quick statistics um, in the, and I'll just concentrate on the last election. In the general election, we had 700 in 2022. We had 767 people registered in the jail. Now that's out of around 1,300 residents. So the number of registrations is quite good. In the Bureau of Prisons, we have about 3,200 um, residents and 920 of them are registered. So as far as votes collected, we had 241 in uh, the general election for 2022 in the DC jail and 403, which we're quite proud of, um, scattered across the country in the Federal Bureau of Prisons. Oh, I'm sorry. So some of the challenges that we that, that we face and that you will face if you try to partner with your local jail is identifying residents. One of our biggest challenges is identifying those in the Federal Bureau of Prisons. 
because the Federal Bureau of Prisons is not compelled to provide me with lists of inmates. In fact, privacy laws does not allow them to tell me who is who from DC is registered within is I'm sorry, who in DC is incarcerated within the Federal Bureau of Prisons. Uh, and, and an even bigger challenge is the transient nature of corrections. Most of the people who are registered in the Bureau of Prisons actually first registered while in the Department of Corrections, and then they moved on to the Federal Bureau of Prisons. If they don't reach out to us, we may not know where it is that they currently reside. Therefore, we wouldn't know how to communicate with them, let alone send them their, their ballot. Another big issue is many people who are incarcerated are incarcerated under an alias. Now, you certainly don't register to vote under an alias, but if you're incarcerated under an alias and we send you a ballot, it's going to be rejected by that Department of Corrections or the Federal Bureau of Prisons because um, they're not aware that that person actually lives there. We got around that by adding to our forms that if you have an alias and you are incarcerated to please provide us that alias. And it's working quite well. I wanna say we have about 15 people um, on our rolls that have in, in corrections that have provided an alias and allows us to communicate and send them a ballot. Another um, big challenge is actually resident uh, education. There's various touch points that you can use to, um, uh, to speak about corrections. When you're first arrested or first transferred over to the Bureau of Prisons or any jail for that matter, top of mind is not registering to vote. However, almost all departments of corrections have some sort of an orientation class that might be an hour or a day. They've got handbooks, they've got caseworkers that they deal with. In fact, they've all got caseworkers that they deal with. And there's also uh, release programming would be an opportunity in order to, uh, opportunity, excuse me, to provide education for those who are releasing on what their voting rights are and maybe how to restore those rights. Um, one, of the, one of the ways to overcome that challenge of education is actually to provide all of those materials and to provide the caseworkers education on how to fill out some of those materials with the inmate population. Another challenge is correctional staff um, knowledge. Many correctional staff aren't even gonna realize that the people in their charge are eligible to vote, or at least some of them are. Um, another big one is the staff bandwidth. And the reason why it's in red there is that's just how important it is. People in corrections do not work in corrections so that they can sign people up to register to vote. It's just the reality. They're worried about uh, staff safety, inmate safety, the public safety, uh, inmate uh, programming, uh, particularly reentry and release readiness. And registering to vote is quite far down on their totem pole of things to do. And then there's the willingness of staff uh, in, in corrections. Some of them just don't believe. Uh, and there may be quite a people on this call that may not even believe that uh, folks who are incarcerated should be able to vote. But the fact is, um, many of them can. Um, and often the willingness, meaning um, they don't believe that they should, and therefore some of their attitudes may uh, inadvertently get in the way of a program. Uh, advocacy groups. Now, why do I list advocacy groups underneath challenges? Well, advocacy groups, I will tell you, increase our, our roles by at least twofold, if not more. They're fantastic. But departments of corrections are by nature and what they do conservative. Uh, and I don't mean that in a, in a political way. They, they like to keep to themselves. They like to operate out of the spotlight. And advocacy groups often bring attorneys to an equation. And attorneys can be uh, very demanding. And they would often get in the way, some of the demands will often get in the way of what uh, you're trying to do. So if you're going to work with um, an advocacy group, you want to get out ahead of, 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 of what your messaging is. It's truly one of those situations where you're gonna catch more flies with honey than you are with, um, with, with vinegar. And then there's the safety. Now, uh, prisons and jails uh, are not necessarily unsafe places, but people perceive those as unsafe. The danger, yes, is always there in a correctional setting. This, the, the danger to visitors and to staff is going to be there, but the DOC staffs 
they know what it is that they're doing. And if they say it's okay to come in, you need to trust them. However, I, I put it there as a challenge because many people just don't believe that. And if you're going to send folks into a Department of Corrections, you might want to uh, have staff take a tour first, get used to it, hear that sound of the door, you know, clanging behind them for the first time, because some people, it's just not right. They don't feel right in a correctional setting. Um, I also list that there as a challenge to give me an opportunity to describe some pictures that we've got here. And the challenge uh, of safety here, that first photo there on the left, those two young women there, one of them is my daughter. And I certainly would not allow my daughter in an institution if I thought it was gonna be unsafe. So please don't, don't worry too much about that. Uh, incidentally, the rest of the photos, the top right, the gentleman there in blue is one of our past ANC commissioners that won an election while he was incarcerated and he has since been released and he came back to help out with voting that day. The middle photo there is to remind you that you are in a jail. The correctional officers do have lots of uh, safety equipment. And the one on the, on the bottom right is some of our inmate workers. So let's call that you know, an, an action shot. Although I don't know that she truly posed for that. Um, so why would corrections want to cooperate with you? Well, in my case, it's the law. So the, D, the DC Department of Corrections they really do need to, to, to cooperate. But we've shown that we have um, uh, five other partnerships with five surrounding counties around DC. We've got three in Virginia, Arlington, Alexandria, Fairfax, and two in Maryland, Prince George's and Montgomery counties. We've got partnerships with each one of those. Now those partnerships illustrate that you can uh, break into the system, so to speak, with, uh, without the law on your side. However, those partnerships range from just providing forms that they can put in the law library or given to a caseworker so that those forms can be provided to the inmate population and they can register through the mail uh, at their leisure. Um, all the way to, we had one who requested a video for us to shoot, which we're working on, that actually explains how to fill out a form. And we that's currently in production. And another partnership that allows us to show up in person and provide uh, uh, voting drives in that manner. One way to convince uh, your local jail to cooperate with you is to speak their language. And one of their hot button issues is recidivism. Now, voting is not necessarily a, a direct link to improving recidivism, but I think anecdotally we can show that there may be an indirect link. One of the things that I learned in 10 years in working in the reentry space for the Federal Bureau of Prisons is connectedness to your community as a, as a, is a big variable on whether or not someone might uh, recidivate. And these are four quotes that we received while in the Bureau of Prisons or while in the Department of Corrections that convinces me um, that, the, that voting can actually improve connectedness to your community. Uh, I feel like I matter. I feel like I'm not forgotten. It's nice when a community has not forgotten that someone exists in, on the inside. Someone got closer to their family because they discussed the candidates with their family. Um, uh, you know, I got to thank you because someone was able to vote for their auntie, and that was an ANC commissioner um, uh, situation. Now, the next line, the, for the first time, I feel like a man, that is highlighted because that's what's important to me. And that's the most one, the one that's most important to me because that showed me um, that this is an important topic and made me pursue this after retirement as a career because you don't get a lot of wins in corrections. Corrections is inherently a negative business to work in and quite frankly to receive something like that was very exciting to me. Another issue that corrections is, is, is always interested in is identification and a voter registration card in most jurisdictions can be at least a secondary form of education of, I'm sorry, a secondary form of identification. And it is a secondary form of identification on the I-9 form, uh, which is the federal form that people use to when they're seeking employment. And many, many folks, if you let them know that they can be a bigger, a small part of a bigger issue uh, uh, in recidivism, which is a government uh, holistic approach uh, to the issue, just having them vote uh, may help a little bit. And the last one that's going to help you um, again, 
as it were, break into corrections is you not being a disruption to their operation. Take whatever win that you can take. If it's just asking them to place brochures and registration forms in the law library for inmates to pick up, then please take that and then increase your uh, partnership later on. Uh, working with corrections is truly a case where you're gonna catch more flies uh, with, with honey than you are with vinegar. And uh, I know I have, I've gone through a lot of information awfully quick. Please ask all the questions that you can and whatever questions we don't get to today, I have an email address that you can use and I'm, I'm happy to answer those questions privately as well as um, help you get any program that you've got off the ground. Outstanding, thank you, Scott. Really appreciate it. The, um, the information is there on the screen, but we'll also include it in the follow-up email that you get. Um, and Scott was sort of talking about both prison and jail. So that's an interesting distinction because uh, in the District of Columbia, uh, people who are in prison can vote as well as in Vermont and Maine. Uh, but I'm gonna turn now to Mesa and Mesa uh, leads a program here in Denver. I live in Denver, so Mesa is my election official. Thank you, Mesa, I appreciate it. Uh, I just got my ballot this week, by the way. Thank you for sending that to me, I appreciate it. Um, and uh, Mesa is gonna talk to us about the jail voting uh, program that Denver has created. So Mesa, why don't I hand it over to you and you can uh, put up your slide deck. Okay. So my name is Mesa. I'm the Voter Accessibility Administrator here um, at Denver Elections. Um, and first, I'm going to start off talking about why is it hard to vote from jail? Um, why is this a challenge for people? Why do we have a program where we go out and we assist voters in the jail? Um, just to put it in per into perspective for you, there's about 427,000 people who are sitting in jail nationwide who are pre-trial. So this means that they haven't been convicted of a crime. About 60% of these people are there because they simply can't pay bail. Um, and to give you a little bit of perspective, that's the same number of people as the entire city of Minneapolis, or all of the active voters in Denver. 75% um, of the people in Wyoming. So that's, you know, imagine if the entire city of Minneapolis um, had restricted access to their ballot. So some of the challenges to voting from jail, first and foremost, um, the mail access is very slow going into a jail. Um, so mail has to be checked going in, it has to be checked going out. Um, and so it takes a lot longer for someone in jail to receive their ballot or to receive um, information from the election division at all to receive their voter card. Uh, most, jail, most jails also have an absence of internet access. So people don't have access to email. They can't register to vote online. They can't request an absentee ballot online. They can't do research online. Um, most jails, you also have to pay to call anyone. Um, so it's very difficult for them to call an elections division and ask these questions. Um, they also, you know, when you're in jail, you very frequently do not have um, access to forms of identification. So you don't really bring your driver's license to jail typically. Um, it's very difficult to cure an absentee ballot in jail if you can even receive an absentee ballot at all. Um, if you are able to request one ahead of time, if being in jail is a valid excuse at all. Um, and then of course there's limited information access. So it's hard to get information about the candidates, about ballot measures, or just about election information in general. Um, a lot of people are also very unsure of their eligibility. So that fear of further prosecution prevents them from um, registering to vote um, or may prevent them from voting, um, particularly in states where uh, someone who has a felony is unable to vote. Um, a lot of people come in with felonies from other states and they're unsure of whether or not this new state that they're in and that they're incarcerated in will allow them to vote with that former felony. So I'll talk a little bit about our jail-based voting program here in Denver. So the efforts began in 2016. They were spearheaded by the Colorado Criminal Justice Reform Coalition, CCGRC. Um, that's a partner we work very close with, uh, closely with. Um, so our jail-based in-person voting began in November 2020. Um, we had to pause it for COVID, and then we restarted it again this year in 2023. Um, so we had three elections this year that we were able to um, 
host in-person voting for. Uh, we also do voter registration events monthly in both of the jail facilities in our county. Um, and then kind of on the horizon, there is a Colorado bill that has been introduced um, that would require this in-person voting in all Colorado jails starting in 2025. Um, so we'll see where that goes. Um, some of the partnerships that we work with. So similar to DC, we also work with our Denver Sheriff's Department. We specifically work with our programs department. Um, they're a really, you know, most jails have a programs department or an activities department. They run, um, you know, a lot of the uh, rehabilitation programs, um, programs for mothers in jail, uh, religious programs. And so voting fits really well um, into what they're already doing for people. They interact on a day-to-day -day basis with the inmates. Um, so it was, it's a really good partnership. Um, we also work very closely with volunteer organizations. So the Colorado Criminal Justice Coalition, um, as I discussed, and then the League of Women Voters. Um, and then we also work very closely with our city attorney, city and county attorney office, um, who helps us make sure we're in legal compliance. So we have monthly meetings with all of these partnerships. They all um, serve a very important purpose and meeting monthly gives us an opportunity for everyone to be heard, um, everyone to discuss the concerns that they have. Um, it provides a forum where we can all keep each other on the same page. So some of the processes um, and challenges, um, I'm just gonna go through the voting process um, as we run it now. So our Denver jail voting process We've tried out a couple of methods, but the method we use right now is um, we go into the pods uh, where you know groups of um, inmates are residing. Um, we ask who wants to vote. Um, they come out and we do an ID check. We take them over to the eligibility zone where we check their eligibility on the spot. So in Colorado, you can't vote if you're currently convicted and serving time for a felony, but people with misdemeanors, um, or people who are there pre-trial, people on parole, they're all able to vote. Um, so we do that eligibility check right then and there to make sure that they're eligible to vote. Um, and then we update their record and issue them the ballot. Um, we determine at that point whether they are an in-county voter or whether they're a voter who lives in another county but resides in the jail. In that case, we would give them a statewide ballot, um, which I'll discuss a little bit later on. Um, one of the key aspects of this process is that we provide mail ballots to the voters. Um, the reason that we do that, um, this is some of the data from our last two elections. And what we found was that about 50% of voters on average want to take their ballot with them and think about it a little bit more before turning it in. Obviously, all, not all states have mail ballots. Um, and so we did also conduct in-person voting um, where we issued ballots that they had to return right then um, earlier on. The reason that we chose to continue with um, fully in fully mail ballot voting um, was so that people could have a chance to think about it if they wanted to, um, and because it was a little bit faster and therefore easier for our partners. One of the um, challenges that we face is that jail-based voting is not codified in law in Colorado um, yet, so we, you know, we work very closely with our sheriff's department, but at any time they could tell us you know, no, we don't wanna do this anymore. So we often make adjustments to make sure that we can continue the program to the best of our ability. So I wanna give you a little bit of um, an overview of how much time this takes us and how many people. Um, so for our voter registration events, it's about two to four hours per facility. We have about 1,700 uh, voters total in both facilities that we work with. Um, and then each time we go, we need, at minimum about one jail administrator or deputy. That would be dependent on your jail's policy for how many people they need. Um, and then we use about two to three poll workers. And this can be conducted by volunteer organizations. So oftentimes we um, hire on volunteer organization staff members as election judges or poll workers, and they go out and do these voter registration events. So we train them and then it's a very small um, time lift um, on our office's end. Uh, for the in-person voting events, it takes about five to eight hours per facility in our experience, but this varies heavily based on ballot length, voting method, um, and jail population size. So I would expect, you know, a presidential election what might take a little bit longer um, than this time period. Um, and for those in-person voting events, we like to have one election staff to do that eligibility check to oversee everything. 
Um, again, we need one jail administrator or a deputy, and we use about two to three poll workers. So um, when it comes to selecting poll workers or election judges, as they're called in Colorado, um, we have found that volunteer organization staff are a really great resource for, um, for this. They are often already working with these populations. Um, they're very interested in becoming involved. Um, and so it's a really easy transition. A lot of times they already have jail clearance because they might be doing other things in the jail. Um, and so that additional clearance, um, which can sometimes take a few months is kind of taken out of the way at the, at the beginning um, when we use volunteer organization staff. Um, but it is really important to pick unbiased, experienced poll workers, particularly in this environment. Um, Scott touched on it a little bit, but the people that you're working with, many of them are unhoused, many um, have experienced um, a lot of trauma, um, people may have severe mental health disabilities. So having poll workers who are able to approach the setting with um, a great degree of emotional intelligence um, and who are there um, and willing to interact with people who you might not normally interact with at a typical voter service and polling site is incredibly important. So we do a little bit of extra training with those poll workers. So the out of county voters in jail, touching back on that statewide ballot point, a lot of incarcerated voters are transferred to facilities outside of the county that they live in. Um, so obviously it depends on your state and whether you have a statewide ballot, um, but in Colorado we do, and that um, is just a ballot where you can vote on just the statewide races that you would be eligible no matter where you live in Colorado. Um, so we issue those statewide ballots so that the people who are out of county are able to receive a ballot. To the greatest extent, we try to register people in their own county ahead of time so that they can receive a mail ballot, but that's not always possible. Um, and the best practice that we found for that is just running the eligibility check at the time that the ballot is issued um, and communicating with the county that you know, this person's eligibility was checked um, and they're good to go. We, they voted at a time that they were eligible because eligibility um, fluctuates so much for voters in jail. So these are a few of the challenges. We have faced more challenges, but I wanted to focus um, mostly on election administrative challenges that um, you might face um, if you do conduct jail-based voting um, in your county. So the first is eligibility. Eligibility fluctuates so frequently um, for people in jail. Um, it's, it can be difficult to determine um, just by asking a voter whether they're eligible. Um, and so the solution that we came up with that for that was a real-time eligibility check. So we worked with our Department of Corrections to utilize their database to ensure that everyone who's voting is eligible at the time that they vote. Um, Another challenge is acceptable IDs. Again, people often don't have um, an ID when they go to jail. Um, so our solution for that was to come up with a confined voter specific ID. Um, you know, people in jail, um, they are, you know, typically they're verified uh, who they are by the government because they're in jail. Um, how, so there's almost always going to be a solution for finding an ID um, for a confined voter of some sort, whether that's working with the jail itself, um, or whether that's uh, you know working with the sheriff's department. Um, another issue that we came across where there's a really high number of unhoused voters in jail. Um, so we worked we worked directly with the voter and then within the state law to kind of identify a residence for those voters. Kind of touches on the next issue, um, which is that you know in Colorado the jail cannot be used as a voting precinct. Um, in DC it can, and I'm sure that varies state by state. Um, but for unhoused voters, we kind of had to find another solution for them. Um, that solution was to use the jail as a mailing address um, and to use another address as a residential address. Um, but uh, much like a college or a healthcare facility, um, you know, jails have a lot of this similar issues where someone is living in a place or residing in a place for a certain period of time that they don't typically live in. Um, and so some of those same solutions can apply. Uh, one of the, some of the biggest challenges come from jail policies and procedures. So some examples are in our jail, um, people cannot move from floor to floor. 
Um, there is a required separation between inmates. So if we bring out uh, a pod of inmates, they cannot interact with another pod. Um, in other jails in Colorado, there are gender requirements where poll workers must be of the same gender as the uh, voters that they're working with. And so each time, you know, one of these policies and procedures comes up, um, typically a security procedure from the jail, we have to create a solution for it. So some of our solutions were creating a mobile voting site that we can move from floor to floor, um, bringing in groups of voters one at a time. Um, and then because jail voting is not codified in Colorado, it's been very important for us to work with jail staff to find mutually beneficial, beneficial solutions. Um, and for any state that it isn't codified, um, having that close working relationship and being willing to be flexible um, and looking at your setup and saying, you know, can we issue mail ballots instead of in-person ballots? Can we change the equipment we're bringing in um, just to make sure that that can continue to happen? Um, the final challenge that we identified was limited information access. Um, one solution that we found to that um, and I think could be implemented even if you don't have in-person voting in your jail is just providing a toll-free elections office phone number. Um, so typically people have to call, have to pay to call in jail. Um, but as another governmental organization, um, the jail was willing to allow our office phone number to be a free to call number um, so that people in jail could reach out to us and ask questions. So even if you're not able to go in, someone might be able to call you um, and ask for an absentee ballot or ask for information um, regarding elections. So Safety and security is another important uh, topic to touch on. A couple um, things that we have found helpful going in is not asking or answering uh, personal questions, um, which we would do generally with any voters that we work with. Um, always pairing up in a buddy system um, with a jail escort that keeps everyone um, feeling safe and secure. Um, and then probably the most important was planning ahead. So what can and can't you bring in? Um, you might be surprised to learn um, what isn't allowed in a jail. For instance, we're not allowed to give people I voted stickers for security reasons. Um, and so we always send an equipment list ahead of time for approval. Um, poll workers need background checks, need to plan ahead for that. Um, and then of course, whether they can move floor to floor. And I do wanna emphasize that in all the years that we've done this, there have been zero safety incidents. Um, I often say that it almost feels safer than a voter service and polling center on the outside because Every voter that comes in, you know, has been um, checked for weapons. Um, they're in a facility where they're not allowed to bring weapons in. Um, and there's a deputy next to you at all times. So um, I have always personally felt very safe and secure in these settings. And then quickly to wrap up, I'm just going to discuss some of the jail-based voting data that we've been able to collect. So this is our last uh, year of in-person events. We um, issued ballots to 187 voters. And you can see here that 72% of those voters were new voters or needed updates to their record. Um, and what we found is, you know, we were going in every single month. So these are just from the in-person voting events. One month before we were there um, doing voter registration. Um, and so what you can see from this is even when you're doing frequent voter registration, those in-person events are still uh, very important because you're still missing a lot of people because of the um, mobility of jails, because um, of the transient nature of people moving in and out. Um, there are a lot of people who uh, are going to be missed if they're not able to register and vote right before the election. So this is a little data from our registration events in 2023. We had six voter registration events and we, register, we were able to register about 400 people. We found that it was about one voter registered every three minutes. So we found that um, it was a really good use of our time. Um, and we were able, able to register quite a few people. And then finally, the last data point I kind of want to make here, these are our three elections. The first column is the general population turnout for all of the active voters in Denver City and County. The middle column is our confined population turnout. So this is when we're measuring all of the people in jail who received a mail ballot or who received a ballot during our in-person events. So these are all of our active in-person voters. And then the last column is if you include the confined voters who were released between the time that we 
issued ballots um, and um, election day. So there are a number of people who leave the jail. Um, regardless of what numbers you use, um, I, my general point here is that we have found that when offered the opportunity to vote, they can find population votes in higher numbers than that of even the general population. So it's a service that people really want to take advantage of. People are very excited to vote. Um, and these are just a few quotes that we received. On the right, there's a quote from um, someone who, uh, an inmate who was able to vote while incarcerated. You know, he talks uh, similar to uh, something Scott touched on. Um, this person is talking about how, you know, when you're incarcerated, you don't really feel like anyone, but being able to vote makes them feel like someone. Um, and then on the left, we have a quote from our sheriff who reiterates much what Scott was talking about with recidivism um, and with the importance of voting to connecting people back to their community. So we found it to be a very um, powerful experience. And then this is my contact information. Again, I'm also very happy to answer questions outside of this. Um, and yeah, please feel free to reach out to me. All right, fantastic. Boy, this was really informative. I, I just, I really appreciate both uh, Scott and Mesa taking time to uh, give us this great information. Um, I have tons of questions, uh, not just mine, but uh, those that were provided in the Q&A. Please do uh, continue to add those. Um, a whole bunch of questions about mail ballots. Um, so let me sort of start there. Um, are ballots, I'm gonna just throw a whole bunch at both of you and you can sort of sort through them here. Um, are mail ballots inspected? Are they opened um, on the way out? And uh, what about, um, the Macy, you just mentioned the circumstance where somebody who's incarcerated, they leave and their mail ballot sort of passes them on the way to the jail. Uh, what happens with that mail ballot? Is that mail ballot uh, then redirected back to their home address or are they just in a position where they need to go vote in person? So let me hand those to Mesa, why don't you start and then we'll go back to Scott. Yeah, um, uh, ballots are not forwardable mail. So when it does go to the jail, it's not able to be forwarded to their home address. Um, so the jail puts it back in the post office, writes released on it, and it comes back to us, the ballot's undeliverable. Um, and unless the voter uh, goes to the DMV on the outside, re-registers on the outside, their voter record would be made inactive at that point. My understanding is in Colorado, they are required to provide a voter registration opportunity upon re-entry. Um, I don't really have any data on how effective that is. Um, generally, when we do go register people at our events, though, we really emphasize to them this is when the ballot's going to come. This is when the election is. If you think you're going to be here, you might want to register to get it here. And if not, you might want to register um, at a different location. But they would get a notification in the mail at their home address as well um, that their record might be made inactive. And then, uh, yeah, go ahead, Scott. Yeah, to address whether or not mail is, uh, is open and delivered, particularly with ballots, uh, no. Uh, ballots are not going to be open. They're going to be delivered. In the Bureau of Prisons, it's through a legal mail process. In the Department of Corrections, they have a different process. I'm not sure what they label it, but uh, the mail is hand delivered and unopened. Any anything other than a ballot, however, is going to be open. So if you're just sending in a registration form and hopes that someone fills it out, that is going to be open. That's not going to be considered legal mail. But anything coming in our direction should be can be sealed by the inmate population and sent out without it being inspected because it is considered government mail. Excellent, that's uh, great news. Uh, so Scott, let me come back to you. Um, can you talk to us about working with advocacy groups? What's that process like? Um, and you know, you, some of your wins and losses uh, in that respect? Great, uh, yeah, lots of, lots of uh, examples with that actually. Uh, advocates are obviously, they're, they're a terrific thing. We can't, we really can't live without them, um, but <clears throat> there are a couple of examples where an advocacy group can get in the way. I do. I will say that it's uh, it's important to understand that the jail is your true partner, and the advocacy group is sort of a, a satellite partner to this situation. So you need to keep charge. I've got two specific examples. One, a local organization produced a video 
trying to uh, convince DC inmate population in the Federal Bureau of Prisons um, to uh, to register and vote. And within that video, one of the, the in fact, the moderator, I believe it was her, said, um, if you don't like your conditions of your confinement, you can form a voting block and you can and, and all vote together and change your conditions of confinement. While that might be perfectly legal to say and believe, and it might be something that the inmate population would do, that is the reason why the Bureau of Prisons will turn down that video. So I, I took a look at it. I asked them to remove that 15 second snippet. And now the Bureau of Prisons is likely to, to accept it. Um, and the, her video getting in there certainly helps out my program. Her alerting them to a, vote, a potential voting block is going to hurt my entire program because it's going to make them think a little bit differently. And you may ask yourself, why do I keep bringing up Federal Bureau of Prisons since most of you are not um, uh, worried about those that are held for federal crimes? I will say that there's 11 pretrial facilities across the country, and one of them can be um, uh, in your location. So I wanted to mention that. A, a, a second issue with dealing with advocacy groups is we had one uh, legal group that is trying to convince the Federal Bureau of Prisons to have all of our mail be delivered via legal mail. Legal mail in the Bureau of Prisons and the DOC, but worse so in the Bureau of Prisons is a very labor intensive process where things are logged in, opened and inspected in front of the inmate and signed for, and much like having a, a signature for, from a UPS delivery man. It's a very labor intensive project. But well, we got 2000 pieces of mail going out next week and I would hate to be that one correctional officer that had to deliver 150 pieces of mail before the end of his shift. So I asked him to back off just a little bit. I'm concerned about ballots being legal mail, but I'm not concerned about this letter. So sometimes advocacy groups, you need to temper their uh, emotions, I should say. Lisa, um, anything else you wanna add on ad advocacy work? Um, I, I found, you know, generally them, generally they're very helpful. Um, I think they provide a lot of, particularly in a state where jail voting is not codified, they provide a lot of, um, fire and impetus to have these things happen. Um, however, uh, I, much to Scott's earlier points, um, sometimes the sheriff's division does not have the same interests as these advocacy groups. So I found that being the election division is kind of a good medium point um, because as another governmental agency, the uh, Department of Corrections or Sheriff's Department is a little bit more willing to have some of those conversations with us. Um, so I found that when we're all in the same room, that's the best uh, situation for all of us. Um, we're, I think, very lucky that our advocacy groups work super closely with us. So we haven't had a lot of issues, um, but I can see how those would come up in other situations. Uh, so uh, a couple of questions about um, uh, when to schedule early voting um, and how to um, organize it in your election calendar. So um, a duplication of resources sometimes can be an issue. Uh, you have to do healthcare facilities. If you add jail voting, you might be working in the same sort of part of the calendar and you might need that equipment and those people for early voting or for election day. So how do you sort through that? How do you find the, like, the time in the calendar to be able to do this? Uh, well, if I may go first, just a very short, quick point. Um, we vote in the in the jails, uh, the vote centers are only during early voting. And we pick three days uh, at the beginning of early voting. And you wanna make sure that you leave time at the end in case something occurs in the jail. You would hate for someone not to be able to cast a ballot, whether in person or, or drop off mail um, because a fight broke out on a unit. So therefore that unit was not able to vote. So you just wanna make sure um, that you're gonna leave uh, any open extra days towards the end because things things do happen. Um, we always do it within our uh, within eight days before the election. Um, that's just because 
before that eight, that eight day period is the last time to request a replacement mail ballot. So we wanna be sure that we're catching people who are unable to request a ballot and receive it by mail. Um, we usually do the Wednesday and Thursday before election day. Election day is a little bit too busy for us. Um, and that does fall after our, our period of helping healthcare facilities. Um, we haven't really run into issues with um, using the same equipment. Um, we use kind of a, a different setup for the jails themselves. Um, but I would concur with Scott that leaving extra time is very important uh, because the jail does have some holdups of its own that occur. And uh, let me, I'll, I'll sort of end it with one more question, which I've gotten several sort of versions of. And that is, uh, when you're incarcerated, it's it seems like you would have uh, limited access to information. Um, and I, I'm aware of no law in Colorado currently, nor uh, any law in any other jurisdiction which requires a jail uh, or a sheriff's office to provide information about um, candidates or issues. I mean, how, how do we sort of thread that needle so uh, uh, a person that's um, an inmate can, can make a intelligent choice uh, about a candidate or an issue? Mesa, why don't we kick it off with you? Yeah, um, this is actually a place that I think advocacy groups can be most helpful in because they don't have the same restrictions that we do as a government organization because there, there is actually a Denver law that prohibits us from providing um, partisan um, or candidate information. So it's very difficult for us to provide that information, but the advocacy groups can make, um, as 501c3s, can make nonpartisan guides to provide to the jails. Um, we've also been able to kind of circumvent that by providing publicly available information that's available to all other voters. So, you know, a ballot information booklet that any other voter would receive, um, debates that are shown on TV. A lot of jails have uh, TVs running in, the, in there. And so the jail has allowed us to tape and record those debates and then provide them to them because um, the inmates could have theoretically seen those at any time as public information. There are also public, um, there are um, protections for people in that nationwide to, per, to um, receive access to getting newspapers and things like that. So those are the adjustments we've been able to make um, within the scope of the law. Uh, uh, yes, the advocacy groups, particularly uh, here in, um, uh, in DC, I would like to give a shout out to the League of Women Voters, keep it up. They do a really great job, particularly with the D.C. jail. Uh, we have a completely different issue with the Federal Bureau of Prisons uh, in that they will not allow others uh, to even provide that information. Um, so that's an issue there. One of the that's probably the biggest question I get from the inmate population. Uh, we the inmates who have access to email are constantly asking, who should I vote for? Who stands for what? And my response is, I'm sorry, I can't provide that information. I suggest you talk with family and friends. Uh, and that's about the best we can do. But the advocacy groups really do come come through for the for the voter. I'm very proud of what they do. So uh, I'm I'm always uh, whenever this question comes up because I've heard that a couple of times recently. I think to myself, just think of all the low information voters that are out there that are not incarcerated. I mean, we we have a lot of low information voters. Uh, so this is not just an issue related to this population. Um, I'm going to ask one more question just because I love it, and that is, is there, uh, this is from Eileen Miller, is there a carryover effect? Are you, have you ever seen um, uh, employees at the jail, uh, guards and uh, police officers and so forth, be sort of uh, more enthusiastic about elections because of uh, the work that they've seen um, through registering and voting of inmates? Um, yeah, we, we have seen that. Um, we do get uh, jail staff members who want to drop off their ballot or are interested. I think the really interesting carryover effect is now when we come in the jails, people recognize us and they're like, oh, yeah, you know, I voted before. This is really cool, guys. You should go do this. Um, or we have people talk to us and say, like, yeah, you know, I voted for the first time ever. And then I wrote to my family members and told them, like, I was able to do it and they should do it. So we definitely see a carryover effect. 
And yeah. it's really cool. Yeah, and we've had a we've had a similar experience. We we've seen the officers wear the uh, I voted sticker quite proudly when they got to vote that day. So yes, that is really cool. All right. Well, thank you so much, Scott and Mesa. Uh, really do appreciate it. Let me do one more reminder about our program. Uh, feel free to um, look up some information. Come, come to HHHCEA -E um, and uh, learn more about our Certificate of Elections Administration program. Um, again, we have the full certificate program, but you can also just take a class at the University of Minnesota and uh, learn more about um, elections administration, some uh, specific areas. Uh, we have um, monthly CEA info sessions. One is tomorrow, so sign up for that one. Uh, it's at noon central time. Um, you can go to that link, or again, if you just search CEA HHH. Um, we have a couple of classes uh, that are coming up. Maurice Turner's teaching a class on election security next month, starting in March. And then Jennifer Morell and Catherine Pearson are both teaching this summer. Um, Jennifer is teaching an intro to election security and then uh, our strategic management of elections administration is also uh, scheduled for this summer. Um, here's more information and you can just go to our web page uh, to always learn more. You can reach out to me if you would like. I'm happy to tell you all that you need to know about the CEA program or if I don't know, I will point you to people that do know. All right, well, thank you again to Scott and Mesa. Really do appreciate it. Um, and for those of you that asked, we will um, be sending out a rebroadcast of this in the next day or two, and it will include contact information for both Scott and Mesa, who will be flooded with questions uh, as a consequence of their wonderful presentation today. Thank you again. Uh, we'll see you next time.